to the Defining Cognitive Science series. Today's speaker is Mark Blair from the Cognitive Science Program in the Department of Psychology. Mark is an associate professor in the Cognitive Science Program with his home department in psychology. He leads his research team in the Cognitive Science Lab looking at how selective attention, the ability to pay attention to important features and ignore irrelevant ones, supports categorization and interacts with our memory and perceptual systems. And he's talking today on real-time strategy video games. Great, thank you, Nancy. Um, okay, so thank you for coming uh, to hear uh, about our research. Uh, we're actually really, really excited about it because it's a, sort of a new direction for us. Um, uh, Drosophila have been used biology, been used by biologists and biology uh, for over a century as sort of a model system. Um, uh, and there's uh, many reasons for this. Uh, some of the primary reasons are methodological, that is practical. So uh, fruit flies are really easy. They, they have a simple diet. They're inexpensive to produce. They're easy to maintain in the laboratory. Uh, and when you're doing genetic studies, the fact that they die in two weeks is a good thing. Um, so uh, so <clears throat> Drosophila have been really, really important. And as a result, there have been thousands of studies using the humble fruit fly. Um, in, in the cognitive sciences, uh, the closest thing we have so far uh, is chess, which has been called the Drosophila of the cognitive sciences, um, as a kind of standard task uh, that's rich and interesting, right? R reflects r sort of real world cognitive behavior, uh, but uh, nevertheless is, uh, is something that you can study as a, as a researcher. It's constrained in certain kinds of interesting ways. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, there's been a lot of studies, like hundreds of studies on various aspects of chess, chess playing, chess expertise, and so forth. Um, this is somewhat ironic because uh, unlike the fruit fly, which has lots of practical benefits, chess is really, really hard to study. Chess experts are hard to find. They're difficult to corral into the lab. And when they're there, it's hard to take good measurements of what they're doing when they play chess. Uh, and so chess uh, has n sort of... Uh, lots of studies, but none of the methodological benefits uh, that Drosophila have for, bio for biology. Um, and unfortunately, uh, for people who are interested in expertise and how we learn over long uh, time uh, scales, ch chess, it, chess experts aren't any different than experts of any other kind. Right? You, you want to study professional tennis players and how they get do what they do, you're going to have methodological problems. Right? It's hard to access data. It's hard to bring them into the lab. It's hard to do studies. Um, so uh, there's been two sort of historical approaches to studying expertise. Uh, one is to do laboratory studies. So you bring people in the lab. Uh, we do this mainly in my lab. So we bring people in. We teach them different kinds of categories. We use an eye tracker to see how they pay attention to different things. Uh, and what we're doing is we're tracking in fine detail learning over about 30 minutes. Right? So all our typical study is like 30 minutes long. Sometimes we run long ones. And those are like an hour, right? And so, uh, the, again, the advantages are precise measurements. We're, we're in well-controlled environment, and we get to see learning. What we get is learning over an hour. So there's other kinds of studies, studies of people who are looking at how certain skills and tasks get automatized with practice. And they, they, they're very bold, right? And they do these crazy studies where they bring people in for like 10 hours, right? And when we compare our little studies to their you know, 10-hour studies, you know, we, we feel a little inadequate, right? We're not really capturing uh, learning over a long scale. And, and, and we begin to get nervous that the kinds of tasks that we're studying, the kinds of environments we have, aren't, you know, aren't sufficiently interesting. And, and the learning that we're looking at is not sufficiently generalizable to the kinds of learning we do in daily life. Um, when, when you... What you really want to do is study expertise. And expertise, unfortunately, is on sort of a different time scale. Expertise is acquired over tens of thousands of hours of practice. Right? And so when we look at expertise uh, and 10,000 hours of practice, all of a sudden, all of these studies effectively go to zero. I mean, the, the, the software actually has the numbers still programmed in. And this is what it looks like. I didn't like remove them. They're still there. They're just effectively zero when you're comparing against the kinds of timescales that we're talking about real experts. And 
this, uh, this sort of brings us to the second approach, right? The first approach is to bring people in, do detailed sort of studies. The second approach is that you have to find actual experts who've already done all of the learning. And then you come in and you say, okay, how are the, what are these people like, right? Um, and this looks pretty good, but this is a, this is a bit disingenuous because what you really have is this, right? You have two data points. You have, you bring in some experts and then you compare them to some novices, typically, undergrads that you find around the lab. And, um, and, and this is uncomfortable because there's this ginormous chasm between these two data points in which lots of things can be happening. And you don't get a good sense of what's happening there from these kinds of studies. And these kinds of studies are, are behavioral studies. Most neurophysiological studies are this way, right? So you bring in some you know, an expert artist and a novice artist, and you put them in the fMRI, and you look at the activation in their brain, and you compare them. This is what you're doing. You're taking a two-point sample from very far apart and saying, oh, look, they're different, right? And this is fine. Both of these research paradigms are useful and interesting, but they're useful and interesting under certain circumstances. And those circumstances are when, when expertise develops in a very well-mannered fashion, right? If it's developing sort of orderly, right, where you get a, a general growth of the, all the relevant skills across expertise, then having two points is fine, right? It's easy to interpolate the rest of the data if things are, are you know, go in an orderly fashion, right? Um, but the problem is that neither of these two approaches, neither the lab studies nor the expertise studies really allow us to evaluate that hypothesis. We don't know how much to trust them because they can't tell us about the things that are in the middle, right? And so we have to find a way to think about how, how the, the variables that are important to expertise might change across expertise, right? In order to say whether it's a sensible thing to be using these kinds of paradigms, like how much we should, how much we should believe them, right? How, how well they, they should generalize. Okay, um, we, uh, I think, have found a solution to this problem, uh, at least in, in, a, in one domain. And that solution is real-time strategy games. Anybody here played real-time strategy games? Ever? We got a few. That's <laughs> great. Good. Um, okay, um, so uh, I, let me explain a little about real-time strategy games. Real-time strategy games, so strategy games generally have been really interested, uh, people, Researchers and expertise have been really interested in re strategy games, chess, Go, Bridge, uh, for many, many, many years. Um, Real-time strategy games are sort of computerized versions, um, the, 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 you know, the, the children of, of the original sort of board strategy games. Uh, they differ in certain ways that are kind of important. So the first way that they differ, um, so this is a screen from uh, the game StarCraft II. Um, the first way in the that they differ is that unlike chess where you get all of your pieces at the beginning and then you just fight, in real-time strategy games there's an economic layer. So you don't start off with your army, you have to build your army, in which case throughout the game you're constantly balancing the economic concerns. Do I have enough money with the sort of military, how big are, how many, you know, pieces do I have? How many, how many fighting units do I have? Um, and so, so that's one aspect in which they're different, right? You have to, you can be strong militarily and weak and economically and vice versa, and there's advantages to that at various points. So it's a complex game in the sense that there's this extra little balancing match over and above something you might see in, in chess, for instance. Um, a second way in which they're different is that, um, is that you don't see the whole board, right? In chess, you see every piece and it's, it's exact position at all points in the game. So there's no uncertainty. In real-time strategy games, you have the, you're playing on a large map, right? And this white box shows our view right here, right? This is this, what we can see at this moment, right? So this is the, this is the blue base, and there's some guys, and you can see that here. You can see the blue's got another base here. And you see the opponent is all the way over here. But you can't see what they're up to unless you have some units over there who can see. And so a big part of the game is figuring out what your opponent is up to. You need to know what they're doing 
what their strategy is so that you can counter their strategy. So in some sense, there's an element of poker here. I'm trying to figure out what the strategy of the other player is to, to guess what they have based on limited information. And this requires you to pay attention to a lot of areas of the board uh, as well as you can. So it requires a lot of attentional uh, skills in looking around at different places at, at the right time to pick up the information that you need. Um, third, the third thing is that you, in these games, you don't have to wait for your opponent to make a turn. Right? This is a very sort of jarring realization where you're used to board games where you know it's all very mannerly and you go and then I go and you go and I go. Uh, this, is, this is a game where you can just go as fast as you can. If you can go faster than them, then you'll win because you'll be able to you know, mine more minerals and make a larger army, and then you go stomp them, and they never had a chance. So the motor skills of performing lots of actions as rapidly as humanly possible is a, is another component in this game. Uh, and it's a nice one for those interested in, in sort of cognitive motor things, right? Chess is think, 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 think. This game is a lot more sort of embodied, if you, if you will. Um, so each game of an RTS game produces lots of lots of data, lots of behavioral data. So in in an, in an average chess game, there's about 40 moves per player. In an average RTS game, in our study, there was 1,635 moves per player, right? So the the, the amount of data that you get is is uh, uh, an order of magnitude larger. <clears throat> And, um, and other, other factors that are important is there's time constraints, there's these resource management things, and these sorts of scenarios, uh, are a more apt analogy to something like, you know, emergency management or air traffic control and other kinds of real world tasks, and in which chess is less uh, analogous. Okay, so this is a video of, uh, of a player in action, so you can sort of see what it looks like. There's a couple of things that are going to be happening here. Um, the player is dealing with uh, a situation in their base. They're being attacked. They're also attacking at several points in the other person's base. So what we'll get a sense of here is the kind of shifting around of attention that you need in order to coordinate all the things that need to happen uh, in-game. So I'll just let you watch this. This is a well-known professional Canadian player uh, named Huck. Yeah, everybody has a, like a code name. His real name's Chris, but everyone calls him Huck. So as you can see, the view is uh, bouncing back and forth between these things um, as he's coordinating attacks in multiple, multiple sections at the same time. Okay, so what does this game look like when you when you watch somebody play? So the next video is going to be of a professional player named uh, Moon. Uh, I actually don't know Moon's real name. Maybe it is Moon. Who knows? Um, and uh, and it's just a video. Somebody somebody went up to him at a tournament and was just sitting behind him and and videoed him playing. But um, but you you know wanna, you want to look at the hands, right? You you can look at the screen, how the screens move, and also look at the hands and and uh, and how they interact with the keyboard. So there's a lot of motor control at, at stake here. There's a lot of practice that goes into these things. Uh, he doesn't have to figure out, he doesn't have to look down at his keyboard to figure out where his hands need to be to do what he needs to do. Um, okay, so you've gotten some sense of what the game sort of looks like. Um, another important, uh, interesting factor is that it's actually pretty popular. Uh, there's like six and a half million players worldwide. Um, and, you know, at any particular moment, if you go on to uh, online to play a game. There's about 10,000 people playing games. So actually, about 10,000 games being played. So it can be, it can sometimes be multiple people at the same time. Uh, so there's a lot of data out there. Right? There's an activity that a lot of people are doing uh, regularly. Uh, another advantage of looking at real-time strategy games uh, are that there's definable leagues. So when you play online, you play against other people, you get ladder points, and you go up and down on the ladder, and you get promoted to a new league. So leagues start here at bronze, silver, and gold. They go to platinum, diamond, master, and grandmaster. Um, about 20% of everybody is in each of these leagues. There's 18% here, and then the top 2% uh, go into grandmasters. 
Um, oh, and 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 so there's some some sense of uh, you know a, a skill progression that's identifiable. Um, the game's also played professionally. Every, in the West, this is, uh, comes as a bit of a shock to people, but uh, this is MC. Uh, he's a, a famous Protoss player. Uh, he's a South Korean player. He's won the, the major tournament uh, three times, has a couple of hundred thousand dollars in prize money. Uh, the top players make annual salaries of uh, about a quarter of a million dollars. Um, they play full time. They play six to nine hours a day, six days a week. Uh, it is a job, a profession for them. Uh, and uh, and the games are 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 televised. They're cast live. The you know major corporations, Samsung and uh, you know Sony and, and a lot of electronics corporations f pay for the uh, tournaments and ho you know sponsor the tournaments. So it's sort of a real sport. They call it esports. And StarCraft Two is one of of several games that are sort of largely popular and and can be played sort of professionally. Um, Another factor that's really important for us um, is this, the replay file. Um, so when you play a game of StarCraft II, it produces a little file that's called the replay file. What you do is you open this back up in the game, and then you can watch the game again, right? Which is great if you want to improve. You see where you went wrong, you see where you went right, you figured out, oh, this guy had another expansion that I didn't see, and that's why I lost. You get to figure those things out. So as a player, it's good for you. It also allows people to cast games. So you can go to people's YouTube channel, and there are literally people who professionally watch other people's games, sort of cast it like it's a sporting event, and say, oh, they're doing this, and they're doing that, and this is their strategy, and so forth, and it's all very exciting. And, um, and so that allows a whole sort of, you know, you can pass the game around, right, and other people can see it in a way that it's hard to replay a sports event, I mean, unless you just take a video of it. But the nice thing for us as scientists is the replay file, in order to recreate the game, actually has to have a list of all of the actions that every player makes and precisely when they make them, right? It has to be good enough, precise enough, to recreate that exact game, right? A replay file in which sometimes the other team wins is not a good replay file, right? And so you, uh, so all of that data is packed in these replay files. And so our project involves digging into these replay files to pull out the interesting cognitive uh, motor data. So I'll just recap what I see as the seven virtues of studying StarCraft II, uh, and just note that literally there is no other research paradigm that I've ever come across that has all seven of these virtues. All of them are making choices. They bring people into the lab so they can't study the long term. They study the long term, but they can't take precise measurements in the right kind of way. Um, and, and studying real-time strategy games does not have those trade-offs. Um, so you get a rich, dynamic task environment. Right? Obviously, if it's complicated enough to be done professionally uh, that with, for large stakes, uh, clearly it's, it's a complicated task. Um, highly motivated participants, right? They just do it on their own. It's out there in the world. Unlike, you know, when you bring in the Psych 100 students and you're like, oh, please do this really boring task. Uh, you get non-invasive and direct measures of domain and performance, right? Like you imagine if you want to study te tennis, right? The Davis Cup is here, but you can't like go wire somebody up while they're in the middle of the championship game. But in StarCraft, in the middle of the most important game of the whole year worth $40,000, you get all of the data, right? You can find that replay file. It doesn't interfere with anything. And that is, uh, that's kind of magical. It gives accurate measures of motor performance and attentional allocation, right? They're not, su they're not super precise. It's not millisecond timing, but it's really good uh, because the game has to be in order for it to work properly. And so you get those, again, sort of for free. Um, you can get large data sets because e everybody who ever plays a game, all 10,000 of those games that are being played right now are producing a replay file, right? So that's a lot of data that's out there. Um, you get numerous variables, right? In a normal study, you go in, you're interested in this particular manipulation, you make the manipulation, you take one or two measurements, and that's it. This is all the behavior through the whole game, right? It's everything. And then it's just up to you to figure out what's, what's the most important relevant bit. Um, and you get many levels of expertise, right? Everybody's playing this game. They're playing for hundreds of hours, thousands of hours, and, uh, and that's all available. that's all available to you. Okay, so what did we do? Um, we went online 
went to Reddit, went to TeamLiquid.net and other places that StarCraft II players hang out. We sent emails to every professional team, emails to every collegiate team. We did all the social media stuff. I did a Reddit AMA. We did sort of ridiculous amounts of effort to, uh, to get people to submit games. There was, oh, are they real? Is this, you know, people are suspicious of all these things and you have to do all these uh, jump through hoops to, to get people to sort of trust you. Um, and collected replays, right? So we had people fill out a survey and submit a replay to our study. Uh, we collected data for a, about a month. Um, and so we've got a bunch of data coming in, a bunch of replay files. 3,360 was the number that uh, met our exclusion criteria. Um, and then you convert that, upload that back as SQL tables. And the SQL table that you get at the end has like 36 million rows. So for a computing person, this is a manageable data set. For a psychologist, this is terrifying. <laughs> right? This is more data than, than you know what to do with. Um, so, um, so we wrote lots of custom scripts to look at everything that we thought might be interesting, uh, and, uh, and, and pick it up on variables that, uh, that, that, you know, based on motor, uh, literature and various other kinds of literatures we thought were, were interesting to us. Um, overall, uh, this is sort of a summary of, of, uh, of one of the findings. Let me sort of unpack this for you. Um, so bronze, silver, gold. So this is, this is uh, the leagues plus the professional players. Uh, time is going out here, five seconds. Um, one of the, turns out one of the key concepts uh, in analyzing and making sense of this data is the idea of a perception action cycle. So you do some things, you shift your screen to a new location, you do some things, and then you shift someplace else. So you, once you, you're, you're, you've got a bunch of actions that are sort of bookended by shifts of attention. And, uh, and it turns out that, uh, that that captures a lot of interesting behavior. And what we can see from this overall graph is that the, the whole cognitive cycle, the whole perception action cycles are getting compressed as people get better and better at playing the game, right? Um, so uh, the first action, the latency to the first action, which turned out to be one of the best variables uh, of everything that we tested, uh, and was highly predictive of, of uh, expertise. Just how fast can you do the first thing that you do when you're shifting to some new place, right? Uh, novices take uh, take over a second to make this decision. Pros take uh, under half a second to make this decision. Um, then there's a number of actions and then a gap. Sometimes there's a gap uh, as people drag the screen a little bit or other things like that. Um, and then you have another perception action cycle. So overall, a bronze player who interestingly, right, we talked about, oh, the long study of 10 hours, right? Uh, the typical bronze player has 200 hours of experience. We're already sort of off the charts, so to speak, in terms of experience, and they're our least experienced group. They have 200 hours of experience, and this, um, uh, and, the, and the compression happens, so the professionals are basically doing twice as much, right? They do everything uh, twice as fast. They shift their attention twice as fast. They, they're, they're doing more actions. Interestingly, they don't do more actions in a cycle. The cycle is basically the same. Uh, it's just all compressed. Uh, when we look at some individual variables, what we see is interesting and slightly concerning in some sense. So it's interesting in the sense that this is workers created per minute. So when you create workers, you're building on your economy. It's somewhat independent of everything else you do, so it's kind of like a dual task. Like, in the midst of all this stuff, you have to go back and make workers. And if you forget to do that, your economy is going to suffer and you're going to lose. So it's really important, but it's also something that um, that's independent. And so it's sort of a dual task situation. And what we see is that the variable changes, of course, uh, across expertise. But a lot of the changes happening sort of in the earlier leagues, right? There's not that much difference here between Diamond Master and Pro. In, um, in this continuum, right? That strongly contrasts with something like hotkey select. So using hotkeys to select units that you've got in the game. Um, those, a lot of the action is here in the upper leagues, right? Not so much change here, and then bang, it sort of explodes as you get up to the professional level. Um, and so our original sort of interest was in seeing how stable are the variables that are important to expertise, right? If it's nice and easy and everything sort of grows at the same rate, then we're good, right? Expert novice studies are fine. But, um, but this, is, this is slightly worrying. 
So what we did to look at the overall pattern of what the important variables are and when they were important in expertise is we built a bunch of classifiers. And now I'm not going to go into a, a lot of detail on the classifiers, but we built five different classifiers that are classifying leagues. So this, this classifier is built to, to tell the difference between bronze and gold. This one is built between silver and platinum and so forth. So we have five league classifiers that are telling leagues people two leagues apart. So the classifier just takes the data that we give it and says, what league are they in? Right? Um, you build this up using uh, decision trees. So you find a sort of optimal split on the variables that you've got to see, um, to, 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 to make the classification. Now, it turns out that it, it's much better to do this not with one classifier, but with a whole bunch of classifiers. So you end up with a whole forest of classifiers. But the classifiers themselves are deterministic. So you can't just use the same classifier a thousand times because you just get a thousand votes saying exactly the same thing. And so you take parts of the data. So you, you build a tree based on a subset of all the variables you're interested in and a subset of all the data. And you do this uh, randomly. So you're essentially perturbing all of these by giving them uh, random bits of data. And then what you end up with is a set of classifiers that's, that's doing a better job than you would otherwise have if you had done a single classifier. OK, so this is the permuted importance for the variables that we were interested in. We also have a control variable. So we have a variable that's just junk, it's noise. And that allows us to say, OK, how much better than noise is a particular variable? Right? It should be, it should be, it should be predicting more than just a regular variable would do. Okay, we're going to judge an importance based on um, how how worse the how much worse the classifier gets if you scramble the variable. That is, if you just you know permute the variable to something random, right? You keep all the numbers the same, but you permute, then the classifier is going to get worse, right? To, if the if the that variable was a really strong predictor, it's going to get a lot worse. If it's the, if it's a weak predictor, it's going to get a little worse, right? Since there's some randomness in how these forests are generated, every time you do this, you get a slightly different answer. Right? To sort of get a sense that, to make sure that the answers are stable over these sort of random perturbations, we, we ran, a, 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 we had 1,000 tree forests, we ran 25 of them. And so this is the histogram of the 25, of the importance of the 25, across those 25 runs for each of the variables. Does that make sense? How important is it in this Forest, how important it is in this one, and this one, and this one, and now we've got a histogram of all those importance values. And what we can say then is, like, look, over 25, this is our control. Like, none of these are doing much interesting. Right? They're not. They're not. They're not better than our control in terms of how well they're predicting. There's a whole cluster that are sort of, you know, similar here. Maybe this one's different from this one, but but you know, you're sort of similar. Then you've got this one, and then you've got action latency, which which crushes all the other variables. Right? It's the best one. Um, and so in this sense, we can get a, a kind of a map of importance of the variables for a particular classifier. And then we just do this for all of the classifiers. So here's the rank importance of all the variables across all the classifiers. Again, our goal here is to look at how stable this is. How stable is the importance of these variables across levels of expertise? So this is the bronze gold classifier. We have APM. Action latency. I'm not going to go through all the variables. There's a lot of them. Um, but what, what you can see is something like workers made is very important early, right? And then mm, less so, and then it drops off at the end. You can look at something like, uh, here's another one. Ac actions impact drops off at the end. There's other ones like minimap attacks that come on later, right? So it's here, but it's important here, right? Hot, unique hotkeys is important only at the end. And then we have a few variables that seem to pop up only in the middle. Right? So this is, this is, again, bad if you're doing some kind of dichotomous sample or extrapolating from very little data at the very, uh, at the very beginning. Um, we, just to see how good it was, we, we did a bronze pro classifier. In other words, we pretended we had only two samples and just to look at and see how different they really were. And so the bronze pro, you know, uh, Classifier makes some mistakes, right? Minimap right clicks is here, but it's absolutely no, it's nowhere here. It's never in, in de, independently useful. It misses things that are that are important only in small bits here, um, and it gets some it gets some things wrong, right? It says seven here, and and this is below five or below every single time, and so you get some scrambling of the importance of the variables, missing certain variables, including variables that aren't 
are anywhere in particular. Um, and so overall, um, I, I think this shows that, that, that expertise is tricky, right? It's complex. It's not well-mannered in the way that we can just grab the beginning and the end and, and, and tell the story. Okay, um, some limitations. Uh, limitations are we have ordinal measure of skill rather than continuous measure of skill. It would be better to sort of see not all gold players are precisely the same, uh, and it, it would be better to have a, a, a continuous measure to do that. We only have one game per player, so we don't have a good sense of how st stable any of these estimates are. There's probably noise there, uh, and we don't have a good, uh, a good feel for any individual player. Also, it's observational. So if we want to say something like, well, learning how to, uh, to, to make workers allows you to, uh, once you've got that sort of automatized, then it allows you to uh, build up bigger armies that you then have to deal with. But we don't have any good causal way of saying this one comes before this one. In most people, in some people, in all people, we don't know. Um, and so observational is not ideal. Um, but these are very, those are limitations of the study that we did first. These are not limitations of the method, generally speaking. So uh, MMR is uh, the, the measure of skill that the company uses, and, uh, and it's a continuous measure of skill, and they've agreed for our next study to share that with us. So now we have a, a, a continuous measure of skill for the next study that we do. Um, um, the, 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 the next limitation was only one game per player. But we can get multiple games per player. In fact, we can do better than multiple games per player. There's a little checkbox in the, in the uh, options of the game that says save all replays. We'll save all replays after every game instead of requiring user to manually save them. There are gamers out there with literally every game they have ever played. Right? Every single one. We have a record, potentially, of every step that this, these players have taken throughout their entire development over thousands of hours of, uh, of practice, potentially. Uh, and so we're now starting a study that's a longitudinal study where we'll try and get those, th uh, those uh, replays from uh, players who've saved them all. And that really takes us from this to what we want, right? which is something more like this. right? We want to know how these things develop. We want to know where they are at every step. In terms of the observational limitation, you can actually create experiments in the game Provided with the game are, is what they call a galaxy editor, which allows you to change virtually everything about the game, anything about the game that you want. And because you can do that, you can actually create a custom map that has an experiment in built in. So that half the time somebody gets this manipulation, half the time somebody gets this manip the other manipulation. Then you put it online under custom games. People can play it and then send you the replays. So you have an in-game a way of doing uh, actual experimental studies. And so one of the studies we're doing now involves adding an additional cognitive load to players as they play. Um, so all of these are good reasons for thinking that this is a very useful line of research to pursue. Um, it's also good even for people who are not interested in, in, in replay analysis per se. In other words, replay analysis can provide you a kind of map of how the, the relevant skills develop, when they're important, when they change the most, so that you can do something like target your neurophysiological study a little more effectively, right? So if you're interested in like multitasking, our data suggests that one aspect of multitasking, worker production, happens, you know, in the first 400 hours of practice, right? You don't have to spend a lot of time and energy and money coaxing, uh, coaching pro players to come into your lab to do your fMRI study of this change, right? You can do it all just to, with, uh, with probably local players. And so these kinds of things, you know, the, having a kind of map of what's changing when can allow you to target later studies that are, that are you know, looking at just one or two units because you, you have something to go on, right? Something to orient you. So uh, just to conclude, so the, the primary finding from our first study is, uh, is that expertise is not really well-mannered in the way that one would like, right? Different variables are important at the beginning uh, than at the end. Some important variables are important only at the middle. Even the ones that are important all the way through change their relative importance as expertise develops, right? This makes generalizing from small samples, either from a, a contrastive design or 
or from just a lab study, awkward and tenuous. Uh, the good news is that the method that we've discovered to answer that question can actually just do the studies in the normal way. We can, we can do causal experiments. We can get uh, detailed uh, information about how expertise develops over long time scales. Uh, and uh, and that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. It can also be used, again, to, to target things like EEG studies or uh, fMRI studies. Um, all these approaches that I've talked about, all the things I've described us doing are available. Uh, you can do with games that are existing right now. Um, but as we get more and more tied in, as more and more of the activities that we do are, are computer mediated, the opportunity for collecting these kind of data about lots of different tasks, uh, becomes a reality, right? I mean, there's, you have, you have people wearing like Fitbits and, uh, that, that track how, mu how much they walk around and, and lots of data on lots of different kinds of activities that uh, that could be studied. Also, games are getting a lot more than just you know pointing the mouse and clicking. Right? There's there's uh, biometrics coming up is going to be a big thing. Eye tracking is going to be a good a big thing. And so you can look at these sorts of things over large timescales in very very rich data sets. So the ability to 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 look at these large data sets that are existing out there in the world is is uh, I think uh, going to be a, a massive trend over the next. Uh, over the next decade. So it's in light of all these things that we, we propose that uh, real-time strategy games are actually a much better version of Drosophila for cognitive sciences because it has lots of methodological advantages, lots of practical advantages in terms of getting data, in terms of getting real-world data, in terms of getting lots of it, in terms of getting very detailed measures, uh, and so forth. Um, okay, so that's it. Thank you. Um, I have lots of people to thank. There's obviously this is uh, that we've been doing this for we doing this for like I don't know more than 18 months now, uh, and, and we haven't got a single publication for it yet, but soon. Um, but uh, but it takes a lot of people and a lot of people who know lots of things that I don't know. So uh, you know the normal uh, I couldn't have done this without these people is is like doubly true. I really literally could not have done it without them because I don't know what they know. So um, so lots of people from the lab are helping. And that's it. I don't just pick some. Um, so, so, in the 1980s, AI went through a similar transformation that you're alluding to here, where um, AI was mostly had mostly been studying static uh, intelligence in static environments, including chess, um, and then they uh, became interested in multi in uh, worlds that have the the characteristics that you're talking about, where um, the agent doesn't know necessarily what the entire state of the world is, and um, uh, in particular, the agent might have multiple goals. So um, in your kind of environment, um, it seemed that the measures that you were taking were fairly low level. Uh, so you're talking about perception and motricity. Mm -hmm. what, where would you go with this in terms of um, uh, studying the motive processes uh, that are behind the scenes uh, in terms of the intentions that um, the users are forming? Is there... Do you see any way that you can actually um, infer what or capture somehow uh, higher order constructs that well, there's diff so, different yeah. goals that people are after? Yeah. So, and that's a great question. So, so what we've done, and this is our first study, and what we've done is just done the easiest version of getting it all done, right? Like of doing the whole process of re replay analysis. So, the easy variables to extract are things like how long till the next action after they shift attention, right? That's relatively straightforward. But, but high level strategic goals require some inference, right? It's a lot less straightforward. But you can actually do it. It's just that it's harder and we wanted to do the easy things before we did the hard things. Um, so you can look at, uh, in some sense like a, like a, um, um, scouting. So you can keep track of when players send out units just to look at what the other players are doing, right? So you can look at scouting behavior, uh, at, but, but it requires 
keeping track of single units as they, as they get used uh, throughout the map. And the programming is just harder. Uh, so, because you're, you know, you're sort of extracting these the less clear-cut things. Even things like where's a battle, right? Because um, one thing, one of the things that, that new players do is they stop making workers and producing things when there's a battle, and per, uh, higher-level players are able to do the same, do both at the same time, um, and that gives them a big advantage. Right? Immediately after the battle's done, they've got a whole army again, and then the new players like, I don't, and then they die, right? So. Um, so you can look at, so, so for where's the battle is actually a bit of a tricky question to ask, right? Because you have to say, okay, well, there's units, and if, if you've got units, multiple attach, attack actions from both players within the same sort of area, then we'll say that that's a, probably a pretty decent battle, protect, battle detector. And then you have to then make inferences about what people are doing based on those kinds of sort of high-level information. So the, the, the long answer is yes, you can do it. Uh, it, it's just harder. It's just much harder. Um, but I think it's it's not it's not different than chess, right? I mean, you can ask somebody after the fact. You could certainly ask somebody after the fact in in, in a game of StarCraft. Um, but you know, based on the board, you have to just sort of say, well, I think they were trying this. Um, so you still have to play the inference game. Does that does that make sense? Yes. There, another question I've got is, in terms of your immersion in this as a researcher. Did you find you needed to play a certain number of hours of this game? <laughs> How yeah. many hours did you have to play? Um, we we um, uh, so t so two things. We we had actually played a bit before we did studies on it. So we played a bit of StarCraft One just as a like a you know in the lab thing that we did at the end of the day sometimes. Um, and then when StarCraft Two was coming out, we're like oh you know and though every lab meeting for like I don't know months, I was like. You know, there's a research project in there somewhere. Like StarCraft is an interesting game. There's an inter there's a re And then when I when I when I heard that the StarCraft 2 replay file had the the screen move in StarCraft 1 it didn't show screen moves. But when I thought then I'm like, "Oh, that's attention. That's a measure of attention. We're an attentional learning lab. That's our study, right?" And uh and so then we got more serious about it. But we we did sort of play and and it's been super useful. Like when I like you know, going onto Reddit and talking to people and just doing like, you know, you do these interviews, you know, the gamers are all, you know, streaming stuff on YouTube and whatnot. And, uh, and, and, and knowing the sort of the lingo and having felt the frustration of losing all your probes to, you know, the DT or something. It, they, like you, there's a, you know, you're able to connect with gamers in a way that you, I wouldn't have been able to do had I not gone through at least some of the, the I, I still suck. So, uh, but, uh, but uh, and then you just recruit people who who know what they're talking about. So we have several masters level players, uh, a part of the research project, a part of the thing. And we've contacted some pro players who have been nice enough to talk with us. So yeah, so you need some expertise because there's a lot of things you're not going to know as a as a less good player, especially about the high level strategic stuff. Yeah. Good. Um, I wanted to ask you about the classifiers. So first of all, great, really, really interesting. I uh, just had a question about the classifiers. So um, you're distinguishing two, so levels two apart. Yeah. Um, is it useful to look at neighbors, or is it mm, too, it's too messy? Okay. Um, I mean, there's some sense in which, like the, the the leagues are leagues that are useful for matchmaking, but they're sometimes game leagues. Like Blizzard can just promote somebody if they think. They're not playing enough, right? Or, you know what I mean? Like, there's game-related reasons to do promotions. And, uh, and so there's a, there's, there's a bit of noise, right? A bronze player and a silver player, you know, might be, there literally can be, you know, silver players who are worse than, than bronze players. Um, and that's another reason finding the MMR is really important. Uh, because then we sort of have, you know, at least Blizzard's best guess of what their, what their skill level is. And that's the number that they actually use to do the matchmaking. So, yeah. So, uh, so too, there, it's just too, it's too messy. The classifiers just didn't do very well, right? It would have been nice, but. Um. Um, as you were describing this, I thought of Phil Winnie's research project, uh, having worked with him, mm -hmm. and knowing that he's also interested in collecting lots of data, he presented. Yeah, why didn't he come? I'm going to tell him about this. He's going to have to watch this online. This is really we, cool. We actually talk about this stuff, like yeah, because so for ago. people who don't know, uh, Phil Phil studies um, 
wants to study, well, has started to study massive amounts of learners, uh, learning from textual material, so from a web browser, for instance. And um, so as you were describing this, I was thinking that, of course, an important aspect of expertise is that, you know, at the higher ends, like the chess masters, do a lot of reading and thinking and discussing about about chess. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that you can, how you'd study that within your paradigm, right? Yeah. You basically can't, but it could be augmented in principle by a tool that records um, what the user is reading and how they're, how they're reading it, basically. Now, you know, this is a little bit futuristic, but down the road, that is the kind of thing that Phil Winnie would like to do, is to yeah. really keep track of what people are, are reading. So then you'd have a picture of the kind of, of, uh, of that kind of data, which before you just, what people just weren't able to pick up. Yeah, you can look, so um, the different games do things slightly differently. There's a, a different game, a different RTS game called Dota 2. And in Dota 2, there's a lot of content available in the client. Like, uh, like you can watch other replays in, in the game itself. Um, and you can, uh, and then there's like a training tab, which has special practice things that you can do. And it, uh, th that data is not publicly available, but the companies do collect that sort of thing. Like, if, so if you were at Valve and you, and you, you know, just started recording, who was checking out the training materials and did they improve? Right? Then you could begin to look at that sort of thing. You could, in StarCraft 2, you could, you could make a custom map that at the beginning had a couple of survey questions, like how often are you doing this or that. And that's what you'd get in chess, right? People ask, one of the best predictors, I love this one, one of the best predictors of chess expertise is the log number of chess books that you own, right? Now, now this is a variable that's completely like divorced from actual performance, right? You could just literally go to the bot, go to the store and buy a whole bunch of chess books and chess, chess books and be like, whoa, look, I'm awesome. But, um, but it's nevertheless predictive, right? It's a sort of this peripheral thing to, to show interest. And so you could look at uh, how many other games are, replays are they watching in the client, how many, and, and begin to do that sort of thing. Uh, I think one of the interesting things about esports, generally speaking, is that it, unlike, unlike ballet, right? Ballet has been trained for like hundreds of years, right? So they know, okay, you gotta put your foot like this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you start when you're like five, and then, you know, by the time you're 16, you can actually do some ballet, right? So it's a, this enormous, slow, very tedious pro And you're doing a lot of things that aren't really ballet in the normal way. In these games, you play the game, right? That's the primary way of getting better. And I think it would be really interesting if you could create uh, sort of interventions that, that tried to break down the skills a bit. Like, what, what are they missing? Is it a, is it a Mother thing? Is it a, is it a perceptual thing? Is it a, can I show them a bunch of scenarios and have them rate and say, if you can rate whether this army should win against this army really fast, then that's good. Then you've learned some, you know, showing some knowledge and stuff. So I think that's a really interesting line, right? To, to, to be able to look at, um, you know, interventions that would speed learning along in, in these sorts of scenarios. Because they don't have long histories the way chess does and the way, you know, ballet, music, and, and other sorts of areas of expertise have. So um, I was just thinking that it, it seems to me that um, these sort of online games are sort of pretty far removed from any other uh, form of cognition, and that uh, you know, like the, like you you have you have these people that you put in front of a computer, they're inserted into a sort of virtual reality, um, they're given certain options and you know certain um, certain restrictions and so on and so forth, and they they like they, you know their fingers are moving in this particular way, and so on and so forth. There's all these particularities involved. Do you think that the idiosyncrasy involved in this sort of uh, performance um, might create a problem with um, generalizing the effects that are observed in the study to like the overall population? Yeah. So there, there's an interesting generalization problem with expertise research. I mean, it's it's one of the primary findings of the expertise literature over the last hundred years, that expertise does not generalize. Right? You can train somebody to be a pro StarCraft II player, and what does that make them good at? It makes them good at StarCraft II. Right? And, and you can make small modifications, like some of the really good StarCraft I players switch to transition to StarCraft II and are still really good, right? because a lot of the mechanics overlap and so forth. So, general, so expertise itself does not really generalize. Right? But you come to any task 
with a set of cognitive capacities, right? A memory that works a certain way, a perceptual system that works a certain way, right? A motor system that takes, you know, 50 milliseconds to respond once it gets the right, the right information. And so those constraints are constraints that we all share, that we all bring to every single test. So while in one sense, the, the expert at StarCraft, expertise at StarCraft doesn't generalize, understanding how people become experts, how the cognitive capacities are tuned, and what what you know what comes first right is it is it is it a motor thing does the motor thing come first or does the motor thing come after perceptual things and what order do they come in how do they interact and relate those kinds of things uh, I think are more general right just in the sense that you know whenever you're studying learning there's learning and then there's learning about X and and clearly learning generally speaking has some relationship to learning about X right um, and so uh, and so I think it's a, it's a really important issue to keep an eye on. Um, but I don't think it's like a deal breaker that StarCraft II isn't other things. Also, I think that the, 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 the statement that it's, that it's not like any real world task isn't totally correct, right? Like air traffic control is a lot about deciding when things are gonna hit each other. What speed, what, what angle, and, and from a very, you know, in a very time sensitive and urgent sort of sense. Uh, and and those kinds of elements are part of StarCraft II. So there are uh, there are overlaps between these kinds of strategy games and other kinds of um, other kinds of real world situations. Um, and I you know I, I I even had a friend who was like who was interested in like moral decision making and stuff, uh, talking about potentially doing some kind of study where where you test because you have these free for all games where everybody like plays against each other, but you 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 had these little ad hoc teams right. And you could you could look at like when people form ad hoc teams and when they break up and and why they're why they they ally with somebody and when they turn on them finally and and then look at those sorts of interesting things right and again it's it, it's it, it's not perfect right no but uh, but I think it's not uh, I think it's not a super big problem. Do you think that there might be a possibility to uh, do research in terms of like social psychology as well? For like games like World of Warcraft, for example, these people like they build a whole life inside of this virtual reality. People get very attached to certain things and they have to make the de these decisions that, that like very often parallel real moral decisions like you say. Yeah. Um, do you think that that might be a possibility in the future to look further into things other than just um, like attention and learning? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the interesting things in our database um, is there's a chat log, right? So when players write messages to each other, like, you know, good game or have fun, uh, which happens, uh, and, or things like, you know, you're a noob, get out, or why, are you, why you suck so bad, right? Or things like that. Like, that's all in the sort of chat log that we've got. And so, so if somebody were interested in, like, social, you know, like, like, you know, social psychology things, it seems like that would be a really interesting data set to look at. It's like, when, when do people taunt each other? When do they... You know, uh, you know, when are they nice and, and those sorts of things. And when you've got thousands of replays, you know, it's, it, it ends up, even if people don't do that every single game, it still ends up being a nice sort of sample. Um, so I, I, I think there's, that's a genuine viable thing. Again, as, as the more social things we do are computer mediated, the possibility of collecting that data and analyzing it for good scientific purposes is, uh, is a very real thing, right? I mean, you know, we collect, I mean, how many people collect, like, social information just to sell you crap, right? To, to get you to click on a dumb ad. I'm a marketing student. Right, right? I mean, that, no, 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 no offense, but, like, how much mental energy is spent on exactly that, right? I mean, couldn't we use the data to, like, help people train each other faster, right? It, what if we could help train a doctor to, to be, do better, you know, uh, la, 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 uh, la what is it? Why, why am I not? Oh my God. It's like this is the standing in front of people and you forget words. Laparoscopic, lath lathroscopic, lathro, what? What is it? Oh, I'm glad I'm not the only one who knows. It's, it's the, you know, it's like where it's the little camera and the thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, uh, so imagine you're having a replay of every surgery. And you could ask your, watch it and ask yourself, how do I improve? What are the things I need to do? How, you know, when do people make mistakes? You know, uh, those are things. Those things become viable, right? It, it, the more we do, that's sort of computer mediated. Uh, so I think the potential is he is huge, right? Because the data set is huge. Hello. 
Last question and your response to it made me think of, um, you know, the, the relationship between cognitive processes and game playing. It, we, I, I'm not a player of this, but as I was watching and thinking about it, it seems like there are a lot of constraints on cognitive processes that um, might be, you know, suggest um, research problems and uh, ways of better ways of understanding expertise. So like uh, the sub bit dicing constraint on multi-object tracking, where people have found that, you know, watching objects in a visual scene is limited by th four or five you can really only um, attend to four or five objects um, similarly there be constraints on memory allocation because you've got you know several different scenes and you have to strategize and balance uh, economic decisions and fighting decisions uh, presumably that has something to do with um, constraints on uh, working memory. Um, have you thought about specific domains like this and how those would, have you come across constraints well, like I mean, that? There is, there is work on video game players and their ability to do object tracking for instance. So people who play first person shooter video games are actually better at, they can track more objects than sort of a normal non-gamer um, person. And, and that's even outside the game. So it's not just within the game that they're able to do that. They're actually able to do that in general. And so there's lots of sort of perceptual skills that seem to be um, generalizable to some extent to, to other kinds of things. Um, I mean, we haven't, done, we, we haven't done anything like that in our lab. Like our, our, our sort of, we're, we're at the early stages of, okay, we've got this big giant data set. What is the, what are the first, what's the first step, right? What are the easy things that we can do that, that pull out? And then where do we go from there? What the possibilities are? So we're sort of, uh, we're sort of in the early stages of that kind of thing. But, um, you know, but you could, you can easily see where, where the constraints are and what, you know, what sort of performance and how those things sort of change over time, right? I and mean, within game, you know, what you see is the experts, uh, in the data is experts are able to do things much faster than you would think they'd be able to do them, right? So their reactions on any particular, uh, pack switch are as fast as you would expect for somebody making a very simple discrimination, right? Is it a letter H or a letter T, right? So there's not like very little decision making when somebody does that. They do that in you know four, 400 milliseconds or something, um, and then and these pro players are making those sorts of lots of d decisions like that just as fast as that, even though it's a much more, more complex scenario. Um, and so you can see begin to see how those sorts of things track and whether they relate to other sorts of scenarios. Yeah, I mean it, uh, you have to do you, you know once you sort of build up your little map here within the StarCraft world, then you can start to do studies that that relate to those. Uh, to those things, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting, and that's the that's the and, and in some sense, just to to build on the previous point, that's the kind of generalness uh, that I see in the research, right? You know, basic cognitive motor processes. So, in terms of where you're going theoretically with that, um, do you plan to look at the uh, Erickson's uh, long-term working memory construct and whether, and retrieval structures, or is that not on the map for you guys? Um, that's a bit, I mean, a lot of the th things that we do in the, the other things we do in the lab, um, are the sort of attentional learning, eye tracking -y things. So that's probably the, the style of work that will continue for a little while. Um, uh, I think some of those things would be very interesting. In part, my, my hope is not that, uh, look, I, we'll do this stuff and, and then I could do this and this and this and this. My hope is to say, there's a gold mine over here, everybody. Like, there's a lot of really interesting things. You're interested in social psychology? Come do replay analysis. You're interested in, in, in you know, eye movements, or you're interested in working memory. Come do this uh, research. It's really interesting, and it's and it offers a lot of advantages. So my my hope is that that you know, I, I if I can jump up and down high enough, people will will just come over and see what the hubbub's all about, um, and then we can get more people involved. Because I think there's a ton to learn, and I think. How, getting your your feet wet and starting this kind of research is going to it'll prepare you for the next ten years, where all of a sudden we get even more and more rich, interesting data sets. I think this is the future of uh, cognitive psychology for me, gathering this uh, this amount of data. Yeah, um, I'm. Yeah, it's great. I mean, you could just see, right? Like, because you can do a simple experiment, you know. So, say you do like a, we're we're planning this sort of cognitive load experiment where we we look at how adding additional load to the game influence players' ability to do various things in the game. 
to see whether things have been automatized at various levels of expertise, right? So it's sort of standard, you know, um, uh, uh, standard study. I'm like totally now lost as to why I was even talking about that. What did you just say? Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I remember what I was thinking though. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so you, um, so you know, uh, in terms of these large data sets, right? You do a normal study. You bring people in the lab, and they sit down and they do your study, and they go away. What do you know about them? Nothing, right? Nothing at all. But if you do a study like this in, in the StarCraft, you know, uh, and you go online and people send you their ID, you can look at their whole match history. You know exactly how long they've played. You know, you if they send you the last hundred replays, and then the next hundred then you have tons more data to, to, with which to, to know about each individual subject, right? And that's, all of that's variability that's just noise in a normal study. But it's variability that could be very interesting uh, if you had access to it. And, and so because you're, you know, you're having people step out of this whole continuum of expertise, you, you can have information about, a lot more information about them. Um, and, and that could potentially be really useful, you know? So I agree, big data sets are good. Um, how do you control for people playing the game on different hardware? Uh, like, or uh, step back, like are, are there restrictions uh, in, in professional sports? You have restrictions on what a baseball bat can be, what a golf club, club can be. Here, do all of the players by law have to have the same screen resolution, the same graphics power processor, uh, the same backing, the same network bandwidth, or is that just anything and do you account for different players having different facilities? So there's a little bit of variability there. So screen size is one, right? So depending on the screen size, you're going to see more or less of the of the map than, than somebody else. Um, uh, you can have players you know, submit uh, with a survey, their screen resolution, and, and so forth. If you're just gathering data like off the internet, then, then that may not be possible. Um, you can play the game on different sorts of machines. Most of the time, that doesn't matter. The goal of the game engine is to produce a smooth StarCraft II game. So the, the job of the game designer is, is so that various bits of bandwidth differences or, or hardware differences, they might make, di may, they might make a small differences to like uh, like the precisely the the richness of the you know of the little guy right, but not make a large difference in the sense that you know it's still the same guy, it's the same shape, it's basically the same color. So there's going to be little differences, but not large differences. The other thing is that when you're playing on an account, like you, everybody pays like you know fifty sixty bucks for an account, and then that's your account. So if you play online and you play a ladder game, if you lose, then you lose points. So people tend to. Be, sometimes be a little stingy with it, you know, like, oh, no, I just made it into Diamond League. I don't want you playing on my account and messing things up. Um, and so, uh, but you can also you can also ask that, right? So, like, we're going to collect thousands of replays from people, and we're going to ask questions like, have you played a significant number of games on somebody else's account, right? Uh, do you play on other other accounts, uh, and those sorts of things. And 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 you can just filter out people that that seem like you're not getting the data set that you think you're getting. Uh, but I don't see it as a big problem. I mean, it, you know, all of that would really worry me, right? Really worry me. Like if I was doing a study in my lab, like, and, and one booth had a certain screen size and another booth had another screen size that was a little bit different and, and one of the chairs was a little rickety and the other chair was real stable, like as an eye tracker guy, that would bother me, right? If the lights are different, like we, we, we put them all, we have a very specific light thing that we have. All of that bothers me. Why? Because when I do a study, I do a study with like 25 people. Like this is a study with 3,000 people. The, those little differences are just meaningless in, in a data set that's that big. So it, you, have to, you have to, you know, obsess about the little details in some sense a little bit less when you have a ginormous data set like this. Um, because it's, it's noise, and noise is bad, but uh, it's not going to prevent you from detecting a signal if you have uh, this much stuff going on. Yeah, I, I'd be more worried about the uh, focus where someone has a Hydra multi-header display, you know, 
three or four high res screens. Oh yeah, no, no, it's uh, it's one screen. It's always one. Yeah, and then and then you know there's cheaters, right? There's map hackers who have a separate display that shows them what the other guy is doing. But I think the proportion of cheaters in this in the in the the, the set of players is relatively small. Uh, one final fast question is is there um, you know the equivalent of deep blue uh, that plays this game and uh, beats uh, the best uh, human level players or yeah um, there uh, no uh, the the AI in this game just like the AI in go is awful <laughs> and and uh, and good players just crush it uh, and, and in fact the, the the best AI that they've got in the game they have to Make it cheat, like it gets more minerals than it than the human player does, uh, in order for it to be more of a challenge. But it's still for a good player, it's not it's not uh, it's not a strong challenge. Uh, a lot of the work in StarCraft Two is is in that area. Like I, I haven't seen anybody else who's really doing our kind of stuff. There was one guy at UCSD who did a study to look at win, wins losses in StarCraft One that was very interesting. Um, but, uh, but, but there's a lot of research on the AI side, right? Where people are interested in making good AIs for games and for, and for StarCraft as kind of a, a competition. Um, you know, it's like the little Lego soccer, robot soccer thing. Have you ever seen that? Uh, it's a, it's a similar sort of thing. You make your, you know, you have your StarCraft AI and they play each other. Um, so, uh, yeah, so people are working on that, but the AI is, is, is not good. It's co it's complex, you know. It's it's a tricky game, so the AIs don't do things that, that human players would do. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think that's probably enough. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. And uh, three weeks from today, we'll have another talk. Dr. Zita McRabiu Tassi from the Department of Linguistics is coming to talk about language systems that have three degrees of length. That is like a short vowel, a long vowel, and an overlong vowel, all in that mean different things when they're, a word has one of those lengths. And, uh, and it's subtitled, A Linguistic and Cognitive Puzzle. So it should be interesting. So thank you very much, Mark.